Facebook. Yeah. I'm aware. What do you mean no audience? Who cares? But you've heard every day, Nathan. <laughs> You're good, yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to History Club for this month, November of 2022. And we're so excited to have you here, whether you're here in person or on Facebook Live. And just a reminder for everyone, our presentations are always on YouTube afterwards if you'd like to catch it there. Um, in fact, one presentation we've had in the past since our theme that this time is Veterans Day is we had a great program on women's military history and the memorial and museum in Washington that's dedicated to that. Um, Carolyn Cuthbert was our guest presenter that day, and it is for the May History Pro Program of this month. So if y'all would like to catch it on YouTube, please feel free to visit our YouTube page at Lee County Libraries NC. Also, um, as another announcement, I'd like to announce that we have just gotten a new book in. It's called Patton's Payback by Stephen L. Moore. Um, Patton's Payback, the Battle of El Guitar and General Patton's Rise to Glory. And one of the veterans who was interviewed for this book was Hubert Edwards, who was our special guest here before. Uh, he lived to be over 100 and he shared his memories of World War II whenever he could. So we're very grateful to him and uh, to all our veterans. And so with that in mind, let's, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today. Uh, our guest speaker for today is Rusty Edminster. He grew up in Chapman during the 1950s. He has two business degrees from Carolina. He joined the U.S. Army in January of 1969 and was sent to Vietnam in January 1970 as a combat engineer. Almost immediately, he became a finance specialist in the Programs and Budget Office in the Engineer Command in Long Bien, South Vietnam. He left Vietnam in mid-December 1970 and went back to work for IBM, where he worked for 39 years in marketing and sales, retiring in June 2007. For over a dozen years now, he has recorded oral histories with military veterans for their families. As of this date, he has produced 547 video histories. He has recorded conversations with men and women who have served our country in the Air Force, the Army, the Civil Air Patrol, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, the Merchant Marines, and the Navy. Many of those people served during one or more of the wars involving the United States, while others served in times of peace. Some of those people served overseas, while others never left the U.S. The thing each has in common with all of those with whom he has talked is that he or she invested some of his or her life in our country, and each has a unique personal history of the time in which he, he attempted, which uh, Rusty is attempting to say for the families of those people. And Rusty now interviews anyone 95 and up as well to preserve their history. So without any further ado, I present to you Rusty Edmister.
the total number of veterans is like 1.2 million, but 80,000 of those are women. And uh, as I said, they just never get any credit. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two or three of those that I've had the pleasure to talk with and to record, but, uh, but I also wanna mention a good friend of mine in Raleigh sent me a text and said, you need to come talk to this lady. She's 102. She was a wasp, and if the people who are listening here or if I don't know what a wasp is, uh, we built an amazing number of bombers and fighters during World War II, and in fact, we supplied uh, bombers to the Russian military. And rather than bringing the pilots home from Italy and uh, England and other places, women flew the planes from the manufacturing site to the war and to Western Canada where the Russians picked them up and took them on to Russia. Um, I, I fell into this after I retired, this, this project I had to interview veterans. Uh, I, had to, I went to a gym one day and it was a man there, uh, this was after I retired 12, 13 years ago, there was a man there who made the announcement I came into the gym that anyone who wanted to watch his DVDs I could take them home and they were at the counter. His name was, uh, I'm going to blow his last name, Ed Chapel. It was older than I was, I didn't know him. And uh, once in a while you do things not because you think they're the thing you ought to do, but because they're the right thing to do. Uh, and so rather than just blowing off his invitation, I introduced myself and I said, so Ed, I'm Rusty Edmund, sir. Uh, what is it that's on this DVD that I need to take on and watch? And he said, well, I was in World War II in the Navy and in the Second World War, and this is my oral history of that time in the service. Why well, never felt that? Because he went on to say that his uh, LCT, landing craft tanks, went to the beach six times during the day on, on D-Day, delivering tanks and in fact, delivered a Piper Cub, a plane, to the beach. And so I took the DVD time and watched, was thrilled that somebody was recording history, uh, history of that particular uh, event and his particular uh, part in it. Uh, and I took it back to him and I said, Ed, thank you so much for, for letting me watch this, uh, I'm a veteran, is this something I can participate in or is it just World War II? He said, no, it's being done by the State Archives in Raleigh and anybody that's a veteran can be interviewed and, and you know, it'll be put in their military collection for the state. So I went downtown, arranged uh, to be interviewed, went downtown and at the end of my time being interviewed, I said to the gentleman interviewing me, uh, what you're doing is incredible. Uh, history is only as good as it should be if it's written down or recorded in some way uh, so that people beyond this generation will know something about it. And he said, uh, I couldn't agree more with you. And I said, so what about a veteran who's in Asheville? or a veteran who is disabled and can't get to downtown Raleigh, or a veteran uh, who is intimidated by traffic or a lack of a parking place or can't climb the stairs into your building. And he said, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, that day, I bought a camera, uh, a camcorder, a tiny little camera and a tripod, and uh, your number was almost right, but this is an ongoing of spending time with. In fact, one of those veterans is right here in this room. Uh, and, and that man, significant other, has helped me do 30 some uh, oral histories in Carolina Trace, which is the neighborhood here in Sanford. Uh, I want to go back to history for a second. If you're watching this, uh, it's Facebook, right? Or if you watch 
watching on YouTube, wherever it will be, um, you're interested in history. My contention is we are, are all historians. We don't necessarily teach it. We don't necessarily enjoy learning it. We don't uh, record it. But we're all historians because the, the stories we hear within our families, within our friends, uh, almost anywhere, is part of how we got to where we are. And hopefully somebody will be out there recording where we're going. Uh, and as I said, I've had the pleasure of speaking with 550 women uh, veterans. A veteran is someone we celebrated last week on the 11th. Uh, veterans Day was established uh, for the 11th of November at the 11th hour when that was when the armistice and the, the shooting stopped in World War I. That was the war to end all wars. <laughs> we fooled ourselves to that one, unfortunately. Uh, a veteran to me is anyone who puts on the uniform. Uh, the VA will consider uh, a person a veteran, the Veterans Administration will consider someone a veteran for benefit's sake, at least, as long as they serve about eight weeks. Uh, have to get through basic training or boot camp or whatever. Uh, a lot of people don't think they're veterans because they served in the National Guard or the Reserve or something. I disagree with that. They put on a uniform. They invested, as, as Jordan said, invested part of their lives in the military uh, and through the military of our country. Uh, I can't tell you how important it is to record those memories. Uh, when a person passes away, those memories are lost unless they've been pre-recorded somehow. Some people write books, uh, other people write magazine articles. I choose to use video because uh, to me there's communication that happens in a video sense that you can't get off of an audio tape or out of a book or out of a magazine article. Uh, emotion does not count. So I want to start this uh, conversation with you uh, with the name Chet Brumley. Um, I have a, uh, a daughter-in-law who sent me a text and said, my good friend Trish needs you to contact and do an oral history for her father-in-law. And I'm always thrilled to do that. That's, that's how I meet veterans, through other people networking. And so I got in touch with Jeff, and he agreed that I could come to his house. Uh, he lived in North Raleigh. Uh, lived is critical of that sentence, uh, past tense. Um, a month ago, I went to Chet's house one afternoon with my camera and my questions and as we started, Chet said to me, my doctor has said to me, you have six to 12 months to live. It's important to me to tell uh, my stories, my memories while I can. And so we talked, we talked for a little more than an hour. It was very tiring to him. And so I said to him, Chet, let me come back uh, and we'll do part two. Uh, Chet was an airborne ranger in Vietnam. Uh, Chet served in the 25th Infantry Division, was an air traffic controller, but not in the normal sense. Chet's job was to uh, control the flight patterns and landings and takeoffs of helicopters. And helicopters in Vietnam was a huge thing. Uh, Chet, before I left, showed me his his shadow box with all of his medals and awards and that kind of thing. And if you've ever seen a shadow box, then maybe maybe this will make sense to you. Uh, a shadow box, in a veteran sense, is where they keep their ribbons, their medals, their awards, citations, that kind of thing. But Chip's shadow box had four purple hearts in it. And I say four purple hearts. He had one purple heart with three oak leaf clusters, which is the way that's done on military uniform. So what that means, if you don't know, is Chet survived being wounded.
wounded in combat four times. Uh, the first time was at Cu Chi, uh, which is uh, northwestern Vietnam, uh, where there were 2,000 helicopters coming in and out. And he was in a control tower one day when the North Vietnamese Army attacked him, and he was wounded. Didn't tell me how. It's enough to say I was wounded. Besides the Purple Hearts, were four bronze stars. Uh, why a bronze star? But the one that really matters is the bronze star with a small metal V on it. That's for valor. That's for bravery and battle. He had a, a bronze star with three oblique clusters, meaning he had uh, a total of four bronze stars for valor. And he had a silver star. In the way the military does things, the, the awards get more and more important as you go up. The Bronze Star, I thought, was the, the bottom of that stack. It turns out there's another one I'm going to share with you in a second. But the next one up is the Silver Star. The next one up is called the Distinguished Service Cross. The next one up is the Number of Honor. And we probably had 120.
And I said, so why didn't you leave Fort Lee? And he said, well, there were officers there that wanted me to do reports and accounting and that kind of stuff. So I stayed at Fort Lee for my entire time in the Army. Uh, and what I haven't told you yet is Ralph's whole life has been dedicated to art, uh, to teaching and doing art. He's one of the best known people in the United States for needlepoint, for example, but he does acrylics, he does oils. And it turned out that because he was helping the officers at Fort Lee, they gave him the second floor of the barracks to do his art while he, while he was there. And the reason I take you through Ralph, there are a load of people uh, who, who didn't uh, carry a weapon in the battle, they were there to help the guys who did. And, uh, and Ralph's a veteran. Uh, spent two years in the Army and uh, got out and has been in education, uh, in art education, his entire life. He's retired now and lives in Chapel Hill. Uh, when I started this, uh, uh, Jordan had brought up the issue of women in the military. I'm sorry, issue is the wrong word. The subject of women in the military. So I want to tell you about Connie Stedman. Connie Stedman uh, is an African American lady still living in Yanceville, North Carolina, who grew up during the days of segregation. She didn't go to a high school, she went to a training school, which is what the African American schools were called in those days. So she finished high school, and the opportunities available to women in general these days are a lot. Uh, there are a lot more of them than there were for an African American lady 18 years old in Yanceville, North Carolina, which is Casual County up here in Danville, Virginia. So Connie went in the Air Force, and Connie was really good at being in the Air Force, and Connie could sing. So Connie was uh, being interviewed and giving auditions to serve in a special services Air unit who would go around the world entertain the troops. And she did her job so well, not singing now, she did that very well, that's why the auditions, but she did the job so well that they were trying to make her an officer. So she's got both of these opportunities happening at the same time. Going to special services and tour the world as an entertainer or become an Air Force officer. Well, Connie went to sick bay one day. Yes, she wasn't well. And the diagnosis was she was pregnant. Now, those of you watching this may not know that in the 60s, and maybe in the 70s, but certainly in the 60s, if you were female in the military and you were pregnant, you were kicked out. Medical discharge. Strategic Air Command headquarters in Nebraska. 
Uh, I love to talk about Gail because he took an opportunity to be in, in our military and made the most of it. What an incredible journey she had through the Air Force and what a great, a great career she had. I want to talk to you about James Painter. I love to tell you about James Painter. James, as I met him, was a 97-year-old veteran living 500 yards from where he was born in Tazewell County. Uh, James grew up on a farm. And when he turned 18, World War II was raging. And he knew because it was fact that he was going to be drafted. Well, if you got drafted, you didn't get drafted into anything but either the Army or the Marines. So he said to himself, and I'm sure he talked to his parents about it, he said, you know, I really am tired of being on the land. I don't want to be in the infantry in Europe. Uh, so he joined the Navy. Well, that's great. What a great, what a great idea. idea. You want to, won't be in ships in the water everywhere. So he went through training in Norfolk, Newport News, put him on a ship, uh, sent him to Honolulu to be assigned to a ship. He'd been there a week or two, and a guy came in the barracks one day and said, there are a couple of officers in the uh, orderly room, that's kind of a, a facility in the, any of the branches. It's, it's a place that every unit has. They want to see you. Well, if you've ever been in the military, having an officer want to see you is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, but he reported in, and they invited, there were two guys there, the, the officers, and they invited him to sit down and listen. He said, uh, okay. Uh, and they said, we've got something we need you to do for us. And he said, something for me to do for you? What's that? He said, well, you may not know this, Stephen. That's what they call them, basic sailors. You may not know this, but the Marines have just captured Kenny Island. Uh, this is one of the Pacific Islands. Uh, you've heard of Iwo Jima, you've heard of Saipan, you've heard of Guadalcanal, you've heard of all those islands. Well, Kenny was one of them. And we're going to build landing and take off uh, airstrips on that island to bomb Japan. Uh, as we get closer and closer to Japan, we're, we're building airstrips on these islands the Marines have captured. So what does that have to do with me? Well, Seaman, there's also 37,000 acres of farmland on Tammy Island. And he began to understand. So, so Go ahead. Well, we see from your records that your your whole heritage is farming, and we uh, we need you to become a farmer on Ten Island. He joined the Navy to get off the farm, and he said, "So before I did this was a volunteer thing. They were giving him the choice, and he said, before I volunteer to do what you ask." What am I going to be assigned to do if I say no? And they said, so, Stephen, do you know what a landing craft is? And what that is, if you don't know, is a, a vessel, a small boat, and uh, carries Marines up on the beach. And the whole front uh, gate opens, and the Marines rush out, and the bullets rush in. And that day, James Painter became a farmer on Tenney and Island. Now, before you think that the war wasn't there, uh, all those islands out there are volcanic, and they have caves. And there were Japanese still in those caves, and he was actually wounded twice, farming. Ran over a landmine with his tractor one day, another day a sniper wounded him. Uh, but one more thing about Tenney and I. James Painter was on the runway the day the Enola Gate took off with the atom bomb. Uh, what a piece of history that is. Uh, in fact, before that event, one day he had a he had, they had a vehicle beside the tractor and he went up to the runways and he'd love to ride down the tarmac and read the names on the no 
doses of those bombers. And most of them are pretty straightforward. They may just be a picture, they may have a name that's pretty obvious, but he stopped one day because he saw a name he didn't understand. And all the guys were standing out there getting their planes ready for takeoff. And he yelled out the window, so what's an Enola Gay? And if you don't know, that's the plane that carried the F-bomb. Um, I want to talk to you just briefly in that we're talking about flying off of Kenny Island. There was a man here in Sanford whose name was Mark Gillis. Unfortunately, Mark just passed away in the last week or two. And I had the good fortune because of Gail Carucci, a friend here in San I had a good and just a wonderful experience talking to Mark. He flew, uh, I think it was B-17s, it should have been B-24s in Europe. Wonderful man. Uh, and he shared that experience with me and it was recorded. I hope, uh, Gail, that June has DVDs and I can make more so she sees them. But on this subject of flying and being a pilot, I want to tell you about a man, a man named Sutton. And, and all I know is they call his neighbors, his friends called him Sut. And I had a delightful conversation with him on two occasions. Uh, I wanted to tell you two things about that. First of all, his wife and Sut were sitting in a restaurant somewhere in the Los Angeles area before he was shipped overseas. He was a Navy pilot. And uh, he, his wife's whispered to him and later told me, those people over there are talking about us. They probably think we're movie stars because these were young, beautiful people back in the 40s. Uh, but one day, uh, I'm sorry, I should give you more detail. Uh, such job as a Navy pilot was to fly B-24s out in and over the Pacific to look for the Japanese fleet. We didn't have satellites, we didn't have anything like we do today. And so they sent reconnaissance missions out over the Pacific because the B-24 had the longest range of any um, uh, plane we had in those days. The, the Army Air Corps had B-24s, but the Navy had borrowed some of these for their reconnaissance. So one day they came back, and on the way back, they were attacked by a Japanese Zero and shot the Zero down. In fact, Sutton became an ace, meaning five uh, shoot downs, uh, plus I think he had a total of seven. And he figured that the Admiral would call him in and congratulate him on a successful mission. Well, the Admiral did call him, and he reported in, and he was expecting to get a pat on the back. Well, the Admiral said, look here, boy. I give you a crew and an airplane, and I expect you to go do your mission and not engage in fights with Japanese zeros. And he said, sir, with all due respect, I didn't find it. He found me. And I shot him down to protect your plane and your crew. The Admiral said, in that case, son, would you like some ice cream? <laughs> Love that story. Love that story. Unfortunately, uh, son has passed away too. But on the subject of the Navy, uh, I want to tell you about a man named David Kirby. Uh, and I'm changing wars now. Most of what I've talked about already has been uh, before now. Uh, David Kirby lives in a place called Prospect Hill, which is between Hillsborough and uh, Yatesville, uh, in Caswell County, I think. Anyway, David was the operator, uh, elevator operator, on the USS Forrestal. Now, I've never met an operator of an elevator that lifted planes from the hangar deck to the flight deck and vice versa, but that's the way it works on an aircraft carrier. He had four guys that worked for him. He was enlisted, he wasn't an officer. And one day, they had an A-4, which was our principal weapon in 1967, our principal air weapon. And they carried a, a complement of a force on the uh, force hall. One day they were mounting the nose wheel of that A4 on a catapult, which 
launches the A-4 into the air for a continuous flight mission. Unfortunately, a missile attached to the wing of that A-4 fell off and ignited. And it hit a storage fuel tank. It was sitting by the side of some newly delivered ordnance bombs. It blew a hole in the USS Coruscant from the flight deck all the way through the hole in the bottom of the ship. Killed 134 sailors in an instant. And unfortunately, David Kirby wasn't one of them. Uh, and if you've ever heard of this USS Coruscant accident, you've probably heard that John McCain was the pilot of that A-4, and the answer to that is no, that is, that is fiction. Now, some other pilot doesn't matter who it was. The whole thing was an accident, but uh, but David Kirby served proudly in the uh, United States Navy, and he spent some time talking to me about that. Uh, again, I want to tell you about I just meet so many wonderful characters. Uh, I found out that there was a lady in Kannapolis, North Carolina, who was a very proud Marine. And the thing that distinguished her was she was 102 when I interviewed her. So I went down and knocked on the door, of course, and, and I think her daughter uh, opened the door and let me in, invited me in. And I immediately noticed all the Marine Corps uh, paraphernalia around the house. Now, this was her daughter's house, but you, if you don't know a Marine, you don't understand. I was thinking, well, anyway. So we talk, and anytime I talk to a, a veteran, I like to know how they got to the point where they joined or, or were drafted in the military. And so this lady told me about growing up uh, in North Carolina. Oh, I'm sorry, she may have driven that up here. Anyway, point is that as a girl, a barnstormer came to their town, and a barnstormer is a young pilot with a biplane, uh, there's two wings, and they would, for uh, 50 cents a dollar, a quarter, fly you around, because no one had flown in those days. Almost all of us have flown now, but in those days, it was a real novelty. She fell in love with flying, and she was a kid, and she's a girl. Uh, so then from there, and she told me that story, but then I said, so, you were in the Navy, I mean, you were in the Marines. She said, I said to her, that surprised me. She said, I was in the Marines because the Navy wouldn't take me. What? The Navy wouldn't take you, but the Marines did? And I said, so tell me the story. She was too short to be in the Navy. And I'm saying, which means she probably sitting in the pilot seat couldn't see out of the plane. And her height was just an excuse for the Navy not to let her fly. And I said, so, okay, so the Navy rejected you, but the Marines accepted you. And she said, yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because besides being able to fly, I had height. I had secretarial skills. So they sent this young girl to Paris Island, and we're talking about 1943, 44 centered from there to Quantico, Virginia, and she spent the entire remainder of the war in Quantico as a clerk typist, and the Marines' idea was there was a man sitting at that desk, and they could get that man a rifle and send him to the war. But a proud Marine, unbelievable. Unfortunately, she passed at uh, 105 years old. Well, what a delightful conversation I had with her about her time in the Marine Corps. And I'm by far not the only person who ever talked to her. Magazine articles, newspaper articles, I think the Marine uh, Command actually sent two young Marines down to Kannapolis to talk to her. And I, I just wish I could have been there for that conversation. These guys are probably in their 20s who probably don't know how to talk to a woman in her 90s or hundreds, but <laughs> it must have been. If I had been one of those Marines, I'm sure I'd have been terribly intimidated. Uh, 
Let me talk to you about Marines, though, while we're doing that. I've had the pleasure in the last couple of years to talk to two career uh, command sergeant majors in the Marine Corps. Uh, one of those is a man named Bo Durham, who lives in Durham, North Carolina. I'm sorry, lives in Raleigh, but his last name is Durham. And the other is a man named John Irwin, who lives in Sparta. Uh, these men serve 30 years as Marines. Uh, Bo is an African American gentleman. John is, is Caucasian. Doesn't matter. They were Marines. There are Marines. If you don't know a Marine, there's no such thing as a former Marine. Once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine, uh, including this lady I was talking about before. The interesting thing to me was they both, both Bo and uh, John Irwin, Bo Durham and John Irwin, had both spent time at Paris Island as uh, drill instructors and loved it. person charged by the Marine Corps with taking a civilian and turning them into a Marine, a guard at the Leather Act, whatever your favorite term is. Wonderful conversation for the both of them. But while I'm in the Marines, I've also had the pleasure, my summer, of spending the time, and I think we did four different conversations, recording sessions, with a man named Mike Scalise. Mike was from Iowa. Joined the Marine Corps, and I asked him why the Marine Corps. He joined the Marine Corps after Vietnam, so this wasn't a, a wartime assignment for him. And he said, because as a little boy, his mother had given him a Marine uniform, and he loved it. And he couldn't wait for the day that he could earn the right to wear a Marine uniform. He retired as a full bird colonel, and the thing that's more interesting to me is he's doing the job he did as a Marine as a civilian. They, uh, they just took his uniform off, put a suit on him, and now he's doing that job at Campbell June. But on officers for a second, uh, there's a man in Chapel Hill named Jim Anderson. Jim went to West Point, uh, and, which is a military school specifically for the Army. <coughs> graduated, he was sent to Vietnam as an advisor to the South Vietnamese Army. Uh, I knew that President Kennedy did that. I knew that happened, but I've never met anyone who had done it. So I, he did a tour in Vietnam. When he came home, West Point called him and said, you know, Jim, we'd like you to come back and be a part of our physical education department as an instructor. But you've got to get a master's degree to do that. So he did, and so he was in the phys ed department when a, a, a flea named Mike Krzyzewski came through. Mike Krzyzewski, if you don't know, was a long time, now retired basketball coach at Duke University. Uh, but Jim was there when he was uh, a student. And the other person that you need to know about at West Point at that time was Bobby Knight, who was the head coach of the basketball team at West Point, and Mike played for him at West Point. So anyway, you know, you do two, three years of that, and then he went, he left West Point, I'm talking about Jim Anderson now, left West Point, and was uh, sent to Vietnam. Uh, the name Creighton Abrams, A-B-R-A-M-S, he was at one time uh, like that commander in Vietnam. And he called Jim one day and he said, Jim, I'd like to be on my staff. And Jim's answer was, only if you'll make me a battalion commander. Now, when you're in the military, your progression through the ranks depends on getting certain boxes checked. And he didn't have that experience. So, he, so Abrams kept his commitment and Jim was the, at one time a battalion commander. But when he got home from Vietnam this time, West Point called again and said, uh, we'd like you to now be the head of our physical education department, but you got to get a PhD. So 
So they sent him to the Indiana University for a PhD. And he, he shows up at West Point, and one of his new jobs at West Point is to find a new basketball coach. And he called his friend Bobby Knight, remember they were there together, and he said, Bobby, I don't know anything about hiring a basketball coach. You are one, so help me. He said, you don't need to go any further. Your coach is right here on my staff. Got to be the best coach of all time. And uh, and Jim said, okay. What's his name? Oh, Mike Krzyzewski. Mike Krzyzewski's first head coaching job was given to him by Jim Anderson, who at that time was a full bird colonel uh, and the head of physical education in Duke. In fact, in fact, Jim and I had uh, West Point. Um, Jim and his son, who also went to West Point, have written a book called Character and Leadership, and Mike Krzyzewski wrote the foreword. Now, why did I take you to all that? We are surrounded by people who live lives like that. My concern is that we don't always record it. Think about your Thanksgiving dinner. It's coming up next week. How many times have you heard a story over and over again, probably, at the dinner table or in the, the time before dinner or after dinner, told by somebody in your family? Doesn't have to be a military person, just someone in your family. Maybe a grandparent, maybe an uncle, uh, maybe even a sibling. But no one recorded it. Uh, if you are aware, there was a game that I used to play, that you used to play as a kid called Telephone, I think, or Party Line or something. That is, uh, you have a line of people, and the first person tells the story to the second person. Second person tells it to the third, third to the fourth, fourth to the fifth, and then the person who's last in line tells the story as he or she heard it. It never comes close to the story that started on the other end of the line. That's what happens to our memories if we don't record them. Uh, did you know that uh, Uncle Bob was at Iwo Jima during World War II? Well, the next time that story is told is, yeah, uh, Uncle Bob was, um, was in the Army at the Battle of the Bulge in Europe. What? That's not a story. So uh, all of you who are watching this, the, the, the few of you here, please, uh, please do what I do. It's easy. We all have a recording device. This looks like this. It may not be iPhone, but it's a recording device. You can do audio here, you can do video and audio here, and you can upload that file to a computer and save it digitally forever. I just happen to do it with a video camera, and I can't tell you how blessed I am. 551 people. Uh, I've got three more coming up. Uh, can't wait. I learned something every time I talk to a veteran. But one more thing. Talk to a lady in uh, Stedman, North Carolina. No, I'm sorry, Stoke State. And if you don't know where Stoke State is, I didn't either. It's just north of Greensboro. Lady was 105. And I wasn't there to talk to her about military stuff because she wasn't a veteran. But as we talked, she, uh, she told me that her husband had been drafted. And they got married, and he went, uh, she went with him to Texas for basic training. This was during World War II. And I said, okay, so I finished basic training. Uh, he went to the war, right? Yep. Said, so where did they send him? North Africa. Everything sounds right so far. I said, so they sent him to Sicily after North Africa, right? No. What? Wait, my history. The history I know says that those guys went to Sicily. No, no, he was a mechanic. They sent him to Iran. And this is where the new stuff started. I had no idea 
that the United States had any military people in Iran at all. It turns out that the United States, besides providing bombers to the Russian Air Force, provided all kinds of things to the Russian army, and to get around the German front, they had to go further east in the Middle East, and these convoys went through Iran. Our truck convoys carrying supplies, and his job was to keep the trucks running. So there's military information, there's information of all kinds everywhere. Every one of us can be a historian who records. Uh, it'll take you from mistelling a story, but it'll also save that memory forever, particularly if you digitalize it. And one more thing, then I'll quit, I promise. Uh, I am on my fourth interview with a lady down in Goldsboro, not military, going to be 98 years old next uh, March. And she grew up in an African-American family in Goldsboro during Jim Crow, during segregation, during all that. So I was particularly interested in her view of history. And as we talked, she told me she had 11 brothers, uh, I'm sorry, 10 brothers and sisters. Nine of them were girls. So the mom should have had plenty of help, right? Well, as it turns out, I asked her, so I've been thinking about that. Her name is Ernestine Wooten. I said, Miss Ernestine, it occurred to me that your mom had quite a wash day when she did the wash. How did that happen? She said, well, my mom had a big tub and a wash board. and three other rinsing tubs. And by the way, there was this big black kettle out in the backyard where the whites were washed in, in hot water. And I said, so, not a regular washer? Oh, no, no, this is, at least she didn't have to take it to the creek and beat it on the rocks. I mean, but that's the kind of thing that people, particularly older people, have in their heads. We need to get that stuff out and get it recorded. Uh, interviewed a lady who's 100 years old who lived in the Bronx. And, you know, it's a city, so they had electricity. So I said, so tell me about that. She said, we lived in a third floor walk-up. And I said, okay. Uh, so I said, did you have a refrigerator? No. We had an ice box. I have two children. One is 48, the other is 33. They would absolutely die if they had to deal with an ice box. And maybe, you, maybe you've all seen an ice box. And a couple of times a week, a strong, big guy would come with a block of ice that may have weighed 50 or 60 pounds and put it in the ice box. That was refrigeration before we had electrical refrigerators. And the history, unfortunately, the history of those people live is leaving us every day. Uh, Mark Gillis was 102, I think. Uh, my Marine friend down in Kannapolis was 105. Uh, unfortunately, Chet Brumley, who I started talking to you about, has said it before. Uh, there's no such thing as you're a historian, prove it. Start recording this stuff. Write a book, write an article, do a video, do a, a, an audio recording, and uh, I'll shut up because you've got one other things to do. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. And thanks for listening. How many times have you heard this, Gail? 14? Maybe it's new to Ron. So, but neither of you have questions. You know all the answers about my stuff. Anyway, thank you, Jordan. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.